All right, looks like we are live, and I want to welcome everybody to Standing for Truth. My name is Donnie, and I am your host and moderator for tonight's great baptism debate. It is a privilege to have two knowledgeable guests here with me to engage this topic. The question we are specifically debating tonight is, is water baptism necessary for salvation. Gavin James would say yes, he is in the affirmative tonight, and John Crawford would say no, as he is in the negative for tonight's formal debate on baptism. And so before we get into the opening statements and the debate itself, let's get a bit acquainted with our guests tonight. So I appreciate uh, John and Gavin giving us their time uh, for this debate on a Saturday night. And so one could say this is a Saturday night showdown. John, you've been here several times before. Gavin, this is your second time here. And so both of you are no strangers to the Standing for Truth debate platform. Uh, John, why don't we start with you? Great to have you. Thank it you, is a privilege. Uh, so how you doing? How have you I'm been? Doing great. A bit about yourself. Uh, doing great. I've uh, been in ministry since 1997. Um, I attended uh, Fruitland Baptist Bible Institute, got an associate's degree. Uh, from there, received a bachelor's degree from Trinity College of the Bible and received two uh, master's degrees from uh, Liberty University. One is a Master of Arts in Theology and the other is the Master of Divinity degree. And I've been doing my uh, YouTube channel uh, when I have time. And currently I work as a, a chaplain, a, a hospice chaplain uh, during the week. And so haven't had a lot of time to get on my channel, but I, I do when I can. And so uh, it's great to be back, though. Thank you. Yes, John, it's great to have you back. I appreciate the the introduction. If people want to see more from uh, John Crawford, do check the description box for all of the uh, relevant links. So, John, again, thanks for the intro. Gavin James, great to have you back as well. It is a privilege to have you to uh, debate this important topic. And so the last time you were here with us, you were debating uh, a very similar topic, if not the same topic, with Jeremiah Nortier. And I think that was a, a fantastic debate. I really enjoyed that one. So, Gavin, again, it's great to have you back. A little bit about yourself and a little bit about... Um, what you do here in, in the ministry, basically. Well, uh, like I said, before, well, the last debate, I guess, uh, tw 2012 graduate of the West Virginia School of Preaching under the ownership of the Hillview, Ch Hill, excuse me, Hillview Terrace Church of Christ. Um, I've been an itinerant preacher in the Ohio area and, and other locations throughout um, those years since then. And, um, I don't have a YouTube channel yet. I've been kicking the idea around recently after um, the reactions to the debates and everything. So I am on TikTok. I do have some Bible study material, which I haven't been as active as I should have been. It's just Jim Van Sage, which is my, the letters my name switched around. Um, that's my handle on TikTok. If anyone's interested, wants to see the kind of material I put out, Bible study, that sort of thing. And um, so, and here we are. Here we are. Here we are, and I'm excited. This is a great topic, and what I like to do for our audience is provide a solid mix of topics uh, during these debates, and so it's been a, a great week of uh, debates and interviews with more to come, and tonight specifically dealing with the baptism question. So let me go over the format briefly, and then we'll, we'll kind of get right into it, and so we're going to have 15-minute uh, opening statements. Gavin will be uh, kicking us off with his opening statement, followed by an eight-minute uninterrupted rebuttal. And then we're going to have a, a roughly 45-minute discussion. But rather than it being a really strict cross-exam, we're going to make it more free-flowing, more organic, where the debaters can go back and forth asking each other questions related to the topic of tonight. Then we'll have a five minute closing statement where our guests, John and Gavin can wrap up their thoughts and points. And then this is where we get you guys in the audience involved. As always, we will be having a roughly 25 minute audience Q and a period. And so please, if you do have a question, on tonight's topic, is water baptism necessary for salvation? Just let me know who the question's for. If it's for John, say question for John. If it's for Gavin, say question for Gavin. And then uh, tag me with your question, and we'll have a solid audience Q&A. And so with that, we're just going to get right into 
the opening statement, starting with Gavin James. And so, Gavin, I do see your slides up and ready to go. And so just make sure to unmute yourself whenever you're ready. Let me know and I'll start your timer. You got 15 minutes. As we've already stated, the question tonight is what are baptism necessary for salvation? I'm going to be affirming that. Um, it's beside the point, but I think I didn't get a chance to say this before. Um, I was on the other side of this debate um, growing up and up to a certain age before I was baptized in this very um, auditorium, the baptistry up front, so many years ago. So the real question is what are baptism necessary for salvation? Although you could say which baptism is necessary for salvation, because even though it's not necessarily emphasized every time you hear anyone in any denomination or any church or any movement say how to be saved or what must I do to be saved, there is a baptism involved. There's too many verses in the New Testament to say that there is not a form of baptism involved in salvation, a form of baptism that washes sins away, a form of salvation that's for the remission of sins, a form of salvation that does save. So that's really the crux of the matter. It's not a matter of does this save or not. I mean, that is the focus. But which baptism is involved in salvation? We have baptisms that are mentioned in the New Testament. We don't have to go over all of these or define all of these. There's questions about what the baptism of fire means or things like that. Or John's baptism, the baptism of suffering, uh, being baptized into Moses and what that means. Um, now, I will affirm that baptism of the Holy Spirit is not one of those baptisms that is ever described as uh, washing sins away or being involved in salvation or saving anyone. Um, if there's no verse of scripture that says you must be baptized by the Holy Spirit to be saved, to wash sins away or anything like that, um, and someone's going to say baptism of the Holy Spirit saves, we can say the same thing about water baptism, even if there isn't any statement along those lines. So, but that's not really how we break up and interpret these passages. When we look at these passages, when we see belief in baptism coming before salvation in Mark 16, when we see uh, into or unto the remission of sins, depending on your translation, Acts 238, we're talking about repentance and baptism. Again, we're all looking at these verses. We're saying there is a baptism involved. Some will say it doesn't mean it's for salvation. Some will say it's a different baptism, but that's the question we have to come to. And we can't let our assumptions or traditions answer those questions. We have to try to uh, rightly divide what we're reading and what we're understanding. Uh, baptism saves, which baptism is it? Is it a water baptism? Is it Holy Spirit baptism, as some allege? Or is it some other baptism that we may have overlooked or not found in Scripture? That's the, the crux of the question. What is the washing of regeneration? How is it tied in with renewing of the Holy Spirit? Um, how does Jesus sanctify and cleanse the church with the washing of water by the word? These are all the verses we're going to go to. Some will say it refers to water baptism. Some will say it's a different type of baptism. And I don't have to go on to that. We could talk. I would like to spend a lot of time in Romans 6, I'm sure. Um, I'm trying to tread over old ground from debating this before, but I think all these verses are necessary and relevant, and we need to focus on, and the context is important to me as well. Again, I hate to retread old ground, but we have to look at what these statements are are and what they mean. We have very little interaction, John and myself, before this debate. Um, we were talking about planning and we had some other conversations and we joked around a bit. We get along great. Um, but one thing I did ask him was, do you think Mark 16, 16 is scripture? And uh, he said, well, it's in the Bible, it's included, that's, that's fine by me. A lot of people will try to say Mark 16 isn't part of scripture or a certain part of it. That's not what we're going to deal with in this debate, I don't think. And if he changes his mind, then we can focus on other texts. But if this is scripture, if this is the word of God, I insist we um, exegete it according to the rules of Greek grammar and everything we understand. Belief and baptism come before salvation. Um, John may even be more knowledgeable than myself when it comes to the Greek and exegeting things out and, and parsing these verbs and everything else. But you have aorist participles coming before the uh, future tense verb. 
Now, you can get creative with the sort of answer you give to that question or what I'm affirming, what I'm arguing, but I think it's a question worth asking. Why does it seem like belief in baptism come before this salvation? And again, what baptism uh, you believe that is referring to is the secondary question, and that's what makes it important as well. I'll, I'll give you that. In the New Testament, where do we find anything that brings us into Christ other than baptism? And again, what kind of baptism? That's going to be where we really have the battleground. Is it water baptism? Is it some other form of baptism? Is it a spiritual baptism? Is it a Holy Spirit baptism? That's what we're going to really have to focus on. When we look at these texts, when we try to interpret them, that's going to be the main question. To me, it doesn't get much clearer than uh, second, sorry, not second, Colossians chapter 2. In him, you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. There is a spiritual element to this uh, putting off the body of sins of the flesh, the circumcision of Christ, being buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through the faith and the working of God who raised him from the dead. We can talk a lot about a lot of different topics. I don't know what my opponent's going to say, but... Um, in all this, we're, we're talking about baptism. Whatever baptism saves is through faith in the working of God. Um, if it is some other form of baptism, it's through faith in the working of God. It's not to the exclusion of faith. When someone says baptism saves, a lot of times I think people hear baptism only. That's not what I'm affirming. That's not what I'm saying is what the Bible teaches. But if we're talking about this verse or any of these verses, it's, it's through faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, what the word of God says uh, we must do to be saved, whether it's faith alone or faith, repentance, or any number of things, which is something we'll get into, I'm sure. Then it's it's by faith. I don't have any more slides. Um, excuse me. But that is the crux of the argument. Um, we can't go into these passages with any sort of assumption in place, whether it be faith alone, whether it be what kind of baptism is being referred to. We have to look at these passages, look at these texts. And because there's such a multitude of texts, again, no one can say that there isn't some kind of baptism or some form of baptism involved in salvation. The question is, what kind of baptism uh, is being referred to? Give me one minute. Since I do have a few minutes, I'll read Romans 6, starting in verse 1. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who die to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many as were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. I mentioned that verse earlier. There are a lot of things going on, but we're talking about being buried with Christ in baptism. Um, we're talking about a rising to walk in newness of life. We're talking about being planted together in the likeness of his death so we may have a hope of the resurrection. There's no salvation, again, without baptism, and I will say water baptism, and there's no hope of resurrection. That's all the time I need. All right, Gavin, thank you very much for the opening statement i appreciate the visuals and the slides okay so we're gonna now hand it to john crawford and john whenever you're ready you just let me know feel free to share your screen i will get the slides up on the screen for you as you do that i'll remind the audience that we are doing an audience q a and so i am all caught up on the questions that have come in so far thank you very much and Okay, John, you just let me know when you're when you're good to go. And you've also got 15 minutes for an opening statement. John, what I'll do 
is give you a one minute warning when you reach the uh, 14 minute mark. And then you'll know to kind of start winding things down. Okay. Let me know if you can see that. Yes. Okay. Fantastic. I'm ready to start whenever you're ready. Okay. The floor is yours, John. Go ahead. Here we go. All right. The, tonight's question is water baptism necessary for salvation? I'm going to argue with a resounding no. Uh, if we say that water baptism is necessary for salvation, that means we have to add to God's grace and add to what Christ has done. It's the blood of Christ and through the power of his resurrection that sins are washed away, not baptismal waters. Now, let me just emphasize as not to be accused of saying that baptism is not necessary. Baptism is necessary for discipleship, not for salvation. And if you look at the scriptures, and I'll pull up some slides here that prove this, uh, salvation belief always occur prior to water baptism. Now, it is true that water baptism and salvation are connected, especially in the book of Acts. But you have to look at the context and see what is said, especially like Acts 2.38. Uh, I believe he mentioned some uh, other passages I'll get into as well, like Mark 16.16 16, and those things. So I'll go ahead and get into my slide presentation. Now, it's interesting to see uh, what Charles Spurgeon said about uh, baptism and baptismal regeneration. I don't know if Gavin refers to that, but actually... Uh, that's actually what it is if you believe baptism saves you or if you believe baptism is a part of salvation as a, as a synecdoche, as he calls it, I believe is what he referred to it as. But either way, uh, you have to have baptism to be saved according to the Church of Christ's view. Now listen to what Charles Spurgeon said. Of all the lies which have dragged millions down to hell, I look upon this as being one of the most atrocious, that in a Protestant church there should be found those who swear that baptism saves the soul. Call a man a Baptist or a Presbyterian or a dissenter or a churchman, that is nothing to me. If he says that baptism saves the soul out upon him, out upon him, he states what God never taught, what the Bible never laid down, and what ought never to be maintained by men who profess that the Bible and the whole Bible is the religion of Protestants. Interesting to see what uh, his quote was there. So let's get into this. Uh, salvation became or happened first. It was. It, it, was what changed the person. It's what changes people today. Salvation in Jesus Christ happens first. Water baptism follows as a command for discipleship. So salvation was always received before water baptism. That's why it's called believer's baptism. And baptism was always commanded towards believers, not unbelievers. It's commanded towards believers. Uh, baptism is the secondary divine order. Acts 2.41, then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Point, they believed first, then they were baptized. How about Acts 16.30-33? And he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in the house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and his family were baptized. Point again. Notice the command to believe first, and then they were took out to be baptized. They didn't say, be, believe and be baptized, and you'll be saved. He said, no, believe. And they were baptized as a visible sign, an outward sign of an inward work. Acts 8, 13, Simon himself also believed, and he was baptized. He continued with Philip and was amazed, seeing the miracles and signs that were done. Point, he believed, he was baptized. Acts 8, 35 through 38. Philip opened up his mouth and beginning at the scripture, preached Jesus to him. As they went down the road, they came and to some water and the eunuch said, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Philip said, if you believe, that's first, with all your heart, then you may. Notice he didn't say, well, you got to partially believe and you got you to be dunked in water. Uh, as a ceremony, and then you got to pray a sinner's prayer, you got to confess, you do all these things. No. Notice what he says I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Point the eunuch believed and then was baptized. Acts 18 8. Uh, then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all his household, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. They believed first and they were baptized. 
The basis for condemnation in these passages, and this is one of them he brought up in Mark 16, is lack of belief, not lack of baptism. Now, again, baptism is important, but it's not a part of salvation. It's just simply not. You can read the whole Gospel of John. The word believe is used 98 to 99 times. Not once did Jesus Christ ever baptize anybody. Not once did the apostles ever baptize anybody uh, in regards to uh, salvation. You don't see it. And a very familiar verse, of course, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What's the opposite of that? Not believing, you perish. You believe, you don't perish. John 3, 18, he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already. Why? Because he hasn't been baptized? No, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now, the question comes up, what does it mean to believe? What does it mean to believe? Is it just some people say, oh, it's just a, it, can't, it has to be more than head knowledge or heart knowledge. Well, the scripture makes no distinguish, distinguishment between the head and the heart. They go together. So you believe, it means to convince, be convinced that it's true, and the Holy Spirit has to convict the sinner of, that they are a sinner, that the person is a sinner in need of a Savior. And then because of that, the person can choose to receive Christ freely. Then the Holy Spirit comes to reside and baptize, spiritually baptize someone in the body of Christ. And we can talk more about that. But Mark 16, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. Now notice, it's a negative inference fallacy to say that baptism is part of what condemns, because notice uh, what it says here. Uh, Gavin says, well, see, it says but he believes and baptized are going to be saved. Well, that is true because people were believed. They believed first, then they were baptized. That's a true statement. They believed they were saved. They were baptized. Okay, now, notice the second part of this sentence. But he who does not believe will be condemned. If you have it Gavin's way of, of interpretation, it would say he who does not believe and is not baptized will be condemned. But it doesn't say that. The basis for condemnation is a lack of belief. He who does not believe will be condemned. So it's a negative inference fallacy uh, to insert that assumption into the passage. It's not there. Second Thessalonians 2.10, And with all unrighteous righteous deception among those who perish, why? Because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. Not because they weren't baptized. John 5, 24, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life. He who does not believe the Son shall not see life. Why? But the wrath of God abides on him, not, because, not for a lack of baptism. It's a lack of belief. Why? Because a person is saved at the point of belief and justification by faith takes place. John 8, 24, therefore I said uh, to you that you will die in your sins. If what? If you do not believe that I am he. You will die in your sins, not if you don't get baptized. Now, a person obviously should get baptized. It's a, it's a command of Christ for discipleship, but that has nothing to do with someone being born again and regeneration of the spirit and justification by faith alone. Okay, let's move on here. Salvation was, is, and always will be by faith. Romans 4, 1 through 5, we have Abraham. Uh, I, won't, I won't take time to read all that, but just notice what I have here highlighted and also in the uh, yellow. Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And it goes on to say, now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. It was accounted to him for righteousness. Verse 22. How about Romans 5? Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by what? By baptism? No, by faith into this grace, which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Titus 3, 7, having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. 1 Corinthians 6, 11, and such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Romans 3.24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Galatians 2.16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ 
and not by works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. Throughout the Bible, in every dispensation, people have been saved without being baptized. How do you explain? Here's a question I want to ask Gavin. If baptism involves salvation, how do you explain the Old Testament? And they, of course, the Jews baptized Gentiles to convert them to, to Judaism in what they called mikvahs, but there was no Christian baptism until we, we see the New Testament. Every believer in the Old Testament, Abraham, Jacob, David, Solomon, they were saved, but not baptized. The thief on the cross was saved, but not baptized. Cornelius was saved before he was baptized. The point is, baptism does not save anybody. It's not a part of it. Uh, baptism is not found in the Old Testament. Noah, Job, Jethro, Ruth, Manasseh, the people of Nineveh, and all other Old Testament saints were converted. They had their sins forgiven and the righteousness of Christ imputed or reckoned to them the moment they believed apart from water baptism. People in the New Testament were saved by faith without water baptism. Luke 7, 47, in, in uh, verse 50, the sinful woman said, Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. This is Jesus, of course, talking. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. When the Lord Jesus brought a, a sick man of uh, that had the uh, palsy, he said, he saw their faith. He saw their faith. He said, son, thy sins are forgiven me. The gospels relate the stories of many other uh, unbaptized sinners the Lord Jesus saved. Christ saved a demoniac man who was demon-possessed, uh, Mark 5, 1 through 20. That's in Luke 8 as well. A Samaritan woman while she talked with him by a well, and a man blind from birth who came to him after being cast out of the synagogue. You see, baptism is not a part of it. And by the way, we're talking about faith. Do you realize that the, New, the, the Bible, the New Testament, lists salvation by faith more than 200 times, at least 200 times, with no mention of baptism, no mention of works, no mention of uh, you know praying a sinner's prayer, walking down an aisle, all these things that people tend to equate with salvation. Uh, and we can get into a discussion about what repentance means. There's different uh, versions of that as well, different views on that, I should say. Notice here now, the one thing Gavin did mention, I'm glad he did make a distinguishment between what kind of baptism we're talking about, because a lot of Church of Christ people do not do that. He did that, and I'm glad he did. Uh, but I want you to notice something about that, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You didn't see the baptism of the Holy Spirit uh, in the Old Testament or the permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit or the sealing of the Holy Spirit necessarily like you did in, in the New Testament. Uh, we don't have a record of Christ baptizing anybody with water. Isn't that interesting? Uh, we can say with certainty that the baptism of the Spirit of God began after uh, Jesus ascended. And, of course, the ascension, he sent the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. Christian baptism that is performed by a minister or pastor, is all, that's always what happens. Um, now, baptism by the Spirit or with the Spirit is performed by Christ. So yes, when you get saved, Gavin, you can't argue that there's a spiritual baptism because Christ is the very one that predicted, or John predicted, he would baptize with fire and the Holy Spirit. Fire refers to judgment. The Holy Spirit refers to what the Holy the people would receive um, in the book of Acts. And of course, there was a transitional period there in the book of Acts, and that's a whole other discussion. Uh, the disciples were saved, they received the Holy Spirit, and then as we progress throughout the book of Acts, we see uh, that there was no delay. People received Christ, they were baptized in the Spirit, spiritually speaking, then they were baptized uh, in water. So uh, Jesus uh, is a spiritual baptizer. He baptizes with the Holy Spirit of God and not water. All right, the gospel is what saves, not baptism. Paul says, Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, which saves us. And Paul defines the gospel in Romans 1.16, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God for sal to salvation for everyone who believes. Paul gives the content of the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And that uh, is the gospel right there. And there are several New Testament passages where the word baptism is not even mentioned. Uh, there are several books over here. Matthew uh, mentions it 15 times, Mark 17 times, Luke 16 times, John 13 times, Romans three times. 
uh, all, all these different books and things like that. And basically what the Church of Christ does, there's nine water passages. If you notice, Gavin mentioned and we can get into them in the uh, cross exam. Uh, Mark 16, 16, there's Acts 2, 38, there's Ephesians 5, 26, Titus 3, 5, 1 Peter 3, 20. And I don't have time to go into all those, so I'll save all those for uh, the cross exam. And my time is up, so I'm going to stop there. Okay, John, 15 minutes right on the dot. Thank you very much for the opening statement and also the visuals. Great job to uh, Gavin and John, to the both of you on your opening statement. So we've got some good uh, points and arguments on the table to rebut and also to discuss. So we're now moving into the eight minute uninterrupted rebuttal portion of this debate. And so Gavin, whenever you're ready, you just let me know. I'll start your timer and you've got eight minutes for rebuttal. I'm ready. So I'll try to take this point by point in order. Um, the accusation is that by saying that baptism is also a part of the gospel, that it's adding to grace. Uh, the dichotomy is some will say it's blood. Is it blood or baptism? Um, but we can't do that. We can't ask, is it faith or grace? Is it Christ or is it repentance? Uh, we can't separate these things. And we'll have to get into the weeds of the interpretation to go through that. Um, Charles Spurgeon isn't necessarily someone I would say is a, I realize the history and all that, but I want to know what the Bible says. I don't want to know what the Church of Christ says. I don't want to know what most Church of Christ ministers or elders or whatever say. I want to know what the Bible says. So let's get into it. Uh, let's talk more about synecdoche later. Um, I didn't really talk much about it this time, but we'll, I'll address that. Acts 16 is interesting to me how many people bring that up, uh, those three verses. Uh, they don't go down to verse 35. Uh, this Gentile jailer is told, uh, you must believe. Uh, he's taken and he's baptized. And then in verse 35, I think it is, it's when it says that he believed, he had rejoiced because he believed him in his house. Uh, that word believed, and you'll have to check me on that, is in the perfect tense. That can mean a completion of a process. Um, and obviously, that's what Snetsky would mean. It means that the word believe sometimes stands for the entirety of the process. For someone who has no knowledge of the Old Testament scriptures or anything like that, they'll be told to believe, but that doesn't mean there's more to it than that. That's the faith alone assumption that has uh, clouded the minds of so many people uh, over the past 500 years. We did an entire slide proving that belief comes before baptism. I thought we both agreed on that. But just saying belief comes before baptism doesn't mean that salvation comes before baptism. Uh, I don't think that's possible by exegeting any of the texts that we're, again, going to look at. Uh, where in the Bible is it called believer's baptism? I've heard the term believer's baptism. I don't think we should baptize anyone unless they believe. Sorry to many in the comments or watching this debate. But uh, where in the Bible is it called believer's baptism? Just a question I happen to jot down. Um, there are verses that say that lack of faith condemns. Um, I thought it was interesting to note Second Thessalonians uh, chapter 1 and verse 8. Uh, Jesus will take a flaming fire of vengeance against those who don't meet two qualifications, do not know God, and do not obey the gospel. We need to define what obeying the gospel means, but um, it's not solely a lack of belief that condemns in other passages. Luke 13, Jesus says, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Um, and I might be misinterpreting that. We can talk about that. But again, there are passages that say lack of belief condemns. There are other passages that say other things are lacking. Um, some have less, left their first love. Uh, well, well, that's another topic for discussion. Uh, let's pull up my slide. I've got a first rebuttal slide. And again, there are many things about faith and belief, but it's not faith alone. There are some verses that only mention repentance that leads to life. Some verses that only mention confession. I like to ask a lot about Romans 10, confession leading to salvation. Uh, if you don't believe that's a sinner's prayer, then let's talk about what it means. Do we have to confess or not to be saved? Um, I think that's scattered a little bit. If we have one verse that says baptism, we don't make the reasoning baptism only or repentance only or uh, confession only from these passages. 
it's not just a numbers name. It's not just 200 verses versus nine verses. If there's one verse that says baptism is essential for salvation and we determine it's water baptism, that one verse would be enough. Uh, saying that we have nine and getting into weeds of that is uh, saying Cornelius was saved by bapt saved before baptism. Uh, that's a claim we'll have to work out. I believe there is a distinction between the mikvah in the Jewish tradition and John's baptism as well as Christ's baptism. I think John 1 indicates that. It's interesting to me to hear about those four friends of their faith um, being recommended to the man who was saved and his sins being forgiven. His faith isn't even mentioned. Do we conclude that faith isn't necessary? That doesn't make sense to me that we use that passage to try to determine this, this question. Saying Jesus didn't baptize, but his disciples did. That's the passage in John 4. Um, uh, I also wanted to question before I lose track of, lose, lose my time. Uh, where does it say baptism must be performed by a minister or by a, an elder? Um, because if, if there's a verse of scripture that I'm not aware of, um, I need to be aware of that. But, and we don't know the reason why Jesus didn't baptize, although we have 1 Corinthians, if I'm out of time. No, I'm sorry. It's not, that, I was setting my go I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, if Jesus didn't baptize anyone, can you imagine if he did? When Paul baptized certain people and there was uh, things going on in Corinth, um, that was causing problems. Apollos, Peter, and uh, Paul baptizing different individuals, that breaking off into cliques and dissensions, and I'm of Paul, I'm of Cephas, I'm of whoever. Um, there's a reason Jesus didn't baptize, but his disciples baptized more than John's disciples. Um, that doesn't mean baptism isn't important. It doesn't mean it's not part of salvation. That doesn't prove anything. Just saying Jesus didn't baptize, I think, is a kind of a silly argument to answer this question. Is water baptism necessary for salvation? Um, how much time do I have? You, have, you just hit the six-minute marks. So you got two minutes, Gavin. Okay, I was talking fast, so I thought I was going to run out of time. Um, I don't need to talk about that. Uh, I want to know at some point, I'm just going to use up these slides. I don't want to do slides in the, in the cross-examine. Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. I'd like to know John's view on that at some point. Um, oh, there was a question about the Old and New Covenant. I do need to address that. Uh, not only was the Jew, obviously... And John believes in different dispensations, and I believe there is a distinction between the Old and New Testament. Uh, as far as the weeds of that, we don't have to go into it. But uh, we can say that no one um, before the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ needed baptism to be saved. Uh, Jesus can say in Mark 16, 16, 40, 40 days after his crucifixion, he that believes is baptized shall be saved. It will be enforced uh, from that point on, and ultimately, I would say, from Pentecost onward. Um, I could come up with an example. Last year, um, I could probably like manipulate my GPS on my phone in Ohio. Uh, this year, there's a law passed saying you can't do that because that's distracted driving. You can't even like touch it if it's on a stand. Um, if Jesus says baptism is necessary, if John the Baptist is transitioning into that point, pointing to Christ and his baptism, then it makes no difference all the people before that who were not saved, who were under a different system of faith or dispensation or whatever term you want to use. Um, so I thought that argument was uh, interesting, but I think it does need to be, I noticed a comment that already the thief on the cross is going to come up um, before the death, burial, and the resurrection. There's no baptism into the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So... I think that handled all the points. I didn't think I'd have time to cover all of them. I'm sorry if I was going too fast for a lot of people. Um, but I'll, I'll see the rest of my time so we can get into the cross-examination and really get to the root of the, the issues here. Gavin, thank you very much for the eight-minute rebuttal. That was eight minutes on the dot, so good job. Okay, John Crawford, we're now handing it back to you. You also have an eight-minute rebuttal, and so whenever you're ready... The floor is yours. Go ahead, John. Okay, thank you, Donnie. Um, it's hard to refute, of course, everything in eight minutes, so I'm just going to hit a couple of points here. Um, he did um, make a distinction between water baptism and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, again, which I thought was good. Uh, I wanted to, to focus, I mean, he uh, at least, I mean, he mentioned several texts, and I can't get to all of them until the cross exam. So, But Mark 16, 16 has always been a go-to. 
verse for the church of Christ. Uh, it always has. Um, and But it can be, whether you want to argue whether it was in the word of God or not, or part of the original manuscripts, that's a whole other debate. I don't get into all that. The point is we have it, so I believe we have to go with it. Uh, but where it says, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, he who does not believe will be condemned. I think it's clear from the text there, the basis for condemnation is lack of belief, not baptism. And see, what they do is they commit, and of course I get, I'm repeating myself here, but I want to clarify something. Uh, they are committing a, a fallacy there, the double negative fallacy, which implies the assumption that, uh, as Gavin mentioned, you believe, you're baptized, and then that's what equals salvation. And the, ver the you have to look at the next verse. He who does not believe will be condemned. So if it would, if it's Gavin's interpretation, the text would have said, "He who does not believe and is not baptized will be condemned." You see, it's a an inference negative uh, negative inference there to assume uh, to make that assumption in the passage when it simply does not uh, do that. The passage just doesn't allow for that. Uh, he also mentioned about getting into Christ. Now, he's brought up Romans 6, and uh, we'll have hopefully some time to uh, discuss that. But getting into Christ, I mean, the Bible's full of verses. I mean, I, I could spend hours talking about how you get into Christ. Uh, it's not through water baptism and how you interpret those passages. To say that water every time refers to salvation is basically, uh, you know, you're committing another fallacy there, a, lo a logical fallacy, which I think is totally, totally way off base and totally just what I would call heresy. Uh, you're committing a, um, a fallacy there when you say that just because you see water, oh, it's automatically talking about baptism. So it's got to be talking about baptism in every passage it mentions water. Uh, it doesn't. And that's what a lot of uh, Church of Christ era on uh, greatly when they do that. That's called a totality identity transfer. You see water, it must mean water. It's talking about baptism in every passage. It's not. But how do you get into Christ? Okay. Ephesians 1.13 is the order salutis. That's the Latin term for uh, the order of salvation. It, it, mainly, it, it tells us right here. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Now watch this, listen to this. In whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. How do you get into Christ? It tells us right there. That's the order salutis. You're in Christ. You have to be baptized spiritually. It's something the Holy Spirit does. It's a work of Jesus. And by the way, to say that it's a silly argument, Jesus didn't baptize anybody, then you're calling Jesus silly. That doesn't work. You see how that, I think if Gavin would rethink that statement, he might want to retract it because uh, Jesus certainly didn't do anything silly. Uh, and the gospel of John is anything but silly. Uh, it gives us the truth of the word, of what the word of God teaches. And uh, all through, I mean, verse after verse after verse in the gospel of John. And by the way, the gospel of John is the only epistle that tells the world how to get saved. So if baptism is a part of that as a, as a synecdoche key, as he's teaching, why is that not listed in the Gospel of John? That's going to be a question I'm going to ask. Is the Gospel of John not enough to get somebody saved? If it is, then belief is what it takes. Faith alone in Christ and what Christ accomplished. Now, again, I'm not trying to be little baptism. Baptism was commanded, yes, but not for uh, regeneration, not uh, for uh, salvation. A lot of these other verses uh, he brought up, like Titus 3.5, uh, Ephesians 5.25, uh, some of these others, we can get into uh, during the uh, cross exam uh, if we want to do that. Uh, but yeah, the verses, uh, it's interesting that he also refuted uh, because I mentioned about faith alone being in there 200 times. Well, I mean, it's, it's pretty much a good argument, I think. 200 times in the scriptures, you're telling someone how to be saved is faith alone. And the other verses that mention baptism are the water passages. You can actually have to, you have to exegete those to see how they are in line with faith alone. It's not that they're separate in the sense of, well, see, you got all these verses saying faith alone. Then you got all these verses saying faith plus baptism plus works plus the sinner's prayer plus confession and all those things. He also mentioned something about uh, the verse in John that talks about confessing, uh, that passage there has to do with discipleship. It does not have to do with uh, regeneration or salvation. And 
you see, this is the whole problem with the Church of Christ argument. They confuse justification with sanctification. They confuse salvation with discipleship. And in order to be a disciple, you first have to be born again, born of the Spirit. And then, of course, baptism of the Holy Spirit is something that Jesus does. He does it all from beginning, middle to end. And a person can choose to believe and trust Christ, and then that person at that very moment is saved. And here's a question I want to get into. How do you, you know, how do you explain people on their deathbeds in a hospital that are dying that haven't been baptized? They can't get off out of the bed and, and be dunked in water somewhere. No, but they can receive Christ and believe in him and trust in him their last breath and call on him to be saved right before they die. Or else you've got to say, well, that person can't be saved because they, they can't get out and get uh, baptized in water. I mean, you see, it just doesn't work. It doesn't work. It's not a part of the gospel. It never was meant to be. And it's a symbol of the gospel, yes, but it's not a part of the saving power. It's not a part of the saving power. And, and again, if you say that somebody has to, the, the baptism is, is part of salvation, you've got to say the person doing the baptizing uh, is part, is, takes part because after all, that person is actually physically baptizing you. And you've got to say that yourself, you're getting, you're allowed him to baptize you. You're agreeing with it. So you're placing your faith in baptism. I don't think so. You place your faith in Christ, in Christ alone. You see, there's not enough water in any baptistry, lake, river, stream, pond, mikvah, anything else that holds water to put out the flames of hell. Only Jesus Christ and faith in him alone and what he did on the cross through his death, burial, and resurrection can truly save someone once they freely receive Christ alone without any other works prior to salvation or after. And I say I got a few minutes, a few seconds, but I'll go ahead and, and stop right there. John, thank you very much for that eight minute rebuttal. Great job to the both of you. This really is an important topic and it's been a fantastic debate so far. There's a lot of points and a lot of scriptures on the table that I'm excited to, to see you both engage. And so we are moving now into the uh, free-flowing discussion portion of the debate. Uh, John did just end with his rebuttal. And therefore, Gavin, why don't we uh, have you pick the first point or the first uh, topic that you'd like to discuss? Gentlemen, floor is yours. Just a point of clarification. Uh, what's your definition of the word heresy? I know we have people from a lot of different backgrounds watching. Uh, uh, it's basically anything that's, uh, anything that's unorthodox or that's, uh, you know, false teaching. It was not a, a part okay. of necessarily Christian orthodoxy as we know it. It's part of the fundamentals of the faith. Okay. Is that your question then? That was yours. It, it's you your turn for a question. Well, are you asking me oh. a question? How do we decide to do this? Um, I can go next if you want. Um, okay. if you if you're ready, let me uh, let me uh, get to my questions yes. here. I had to be on here somewhere. So, okay, now talking about the Old Testament, you agreed that there were different dispensations. Obviously, there are different time periods and different things. But now, uh, let me just say the. I believe the Bible teaches that salvation has always been by faith. Uh, so, and there was no baptism, of course, in the Old Testament. So are you, do you believe those people like uh, Moses, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Ezekiel, you know, Jeremiah, all those Old Testament patriarchs, those people, were they not saved? In your, in your view? I, th I thought I'd clarified that, but I'll go over it again. Um, just looking at the Old Covenant, the dispensation of Israel, they had a different system of faith, um, different dispensation, whatever you want to call it. I know there's different views about that. Um, that didn't include baptism. Um, after the resurrection of Christ, um, the gospel is um, not any one thing by itself, in my opinion. It's, it's belief, repentance, confession, and, and baptism, um, according to the words of Christ and the disciples throughout the New Testament. So... Um, they wouldn't. No, I don't believe they were unsaved because they were not given a command to be baptized for the mission of sins or anything like that. But that's the distinction between 
one of the distinctions between the old covenant and the new covenant or came before and what came after the resurrection of Christ. Uh, so when you say different faith, what do you mean? When you, when you, you just said different faith in the old Testament, do you, by that, do you mean you're talking about, they just had a different, they responded to the revelation they had at the time. Uh, that'd be a fair way to say it. When I just say the old Testament and the new Testament, um, the old Testament given to Israel, the new Testament, uh, there's no other name, no name under heaven by which men can be saved. Uh, Acts for uh, Jew and as well as Gentile, the gospel. Um, I'm not talking about the belief of individuals or anything like that. I'm talking about the faith, as Jude 3 speaks of the faith delivered to the saints, um, delivered through Moses or angels to Moses and all that, and then delivered in the New Testament, the New Testament. But you can follow up with that because I was a little convoluted there at the end. Um, so I guess I don't want to like repeat myself, but so you believe when the Bible says Abraham was justified by faith, uh, he was justified by faith, correct? I believe Abraham was justified by faith. So he, he was not condemned for, since there was no baptism, he wasn't condemned for a lack of baptism. No, no one prior to the Great Commission was condemned for a lack of baptism. That's no, why, why do you see it that way? way? Go ahead. Because the Great Commission was not given, the church was not established on the day of Pentecost, uh, the gospel wasn't preached, and we can get into the weeds of that. The gospel would be preached beginning at Jerusalem, beginning at the day of Pentecost. So from that point, we have uh, it spreading to the entire world uh, to certain degrees. Okay, well, I kind of partially partially agree with that. There was no gospel in the sense in the New Testament, so I, I could agree with that. And you did affirm that you believe that people were saved by faith in the Old Testament. So that we agree on. Okay, uh, let me ask you. Um, oh, you want to ask me a question? I guess I'm kind of, I'll give you a couple of questions there. I don't want to hog all the questions since we're supposed to have a free flowing discussion. Well, you understand when I say that he was ju justified by faith, I don't mean justified by faith alone. And I, my question should probably be where do you get the idea of salvation or justification by faith alone in the New Testament? <laughs> Well, the text says it. If you read Romans 4, it plainly says that Abraham believed God and he was accounted unto him righteous. I mean, that's either true or not true. If you say that that's true, then you believe in justification by faith alone. If you say it's no, then you don't believe in, ju in justification by faith alone. That's what I read in the beginning of, the beginning of my opening statement was Romans 4, 1 through 5 mentioned it. Uh, Galatians 3, 5 through 6 mentioned it. Uh, Romans, the whole book was written pretty much on, on salvation by Paul, who was basically a theological genius. Uh, he wrote, you know, justification by faith alone. It's all through the scriptures um, and trusting in Christ. Now, let me let me let me put a qualifier here. Some people say, well, it doesn't mention the word alone. Now, you haven't said that, but some will. It doesn't have to say alone because it plainly says Abraham was justified by faith and he believed God. He was kind to him righteous. It didn't say he partially believed and did something else. And when it was several years later, yes, he sacrificed his son Isaac, but that was after he was already declared righteous. Then he was declared a friend of God, but he was declared righteous first. Okay, so will you agree if there's anything else in the New Testament that is necessary for salvation, that it's not faith alone in that sense, regardless of how many times faith or belief is mentioned. Um, oh, I, I don't believe that there's anything else required other than faith. Okay. Um, let's let's look at Acts eleven eighteen. Um, the Gentiles were given repentance unto life. Um, well, we're going to get into what repentance means if we go that route. Um, oh, you want to talk about repentance? I'd rather. Can I retract that? We can talk about it later if you want to ask me what. Okay, because that's, that's really a whole other debate, um, honestly. That's a whole other. Yeah, that's why I don't want to get into it. Yeah, we, can, we, can, we can actually come back and debate that later if you want or discuss it later because that's a whole different. I mean, there's any number of views on repentance. And so we, I think we take too much time. Right, you're right. So if that's okay with you, so we'll just kind of, yeah. I'll, I'll um, retract that question. Do you want to ask one? Uh, yeah, so if you maintain that bat water baptism 
is necessary okay. for salvation. Aren't you saying that salvation is by faith and a ritual? If my understanding of Mark 16 is correct and belief in baptism both come before salvation, whether baptism is a ritual, whether it is however, whatever word you want to use to define it doesn't take away from that message to say that it's uh, salvation by. Um, I, I just really don't understand the, the emphasis on, oh, it's a ritual. Therefore, it's it's not for salvation. Um, it's, it's not uh, because if you. Um, if you if you say that water is part of it, the water itself, how does the water have any saving power? I don't believe that the water does. I never said the water does. So you would probably argue that the obedience to getting baptized is what is, is part of salvation, correct? Then, um, uh, Romans six seventeen, obeying from the heart that form of doctrine, obeying the gospel. But like I read Colossians two. Um, if that's water baptism, you're being baptized through faith and there is a spiritual circumcision. Um, it's not the water at all. In fact, 1 Peter 3.21, it's not the removal of the filth of the flesh. It's not the water. It's not being cleansed in a physical way. It's the answer of a good conscience towards God because that's what Jesus commanded. That's what Jesus gave us in the Great Commission. And that's what we must do to be saved, believe and be baptized, but not so, the exclusion of repentance and confession. Did you, uh, okay, let me ask this question. You believe in a connected key, as, as it's called, which includes, now correct me if I'm wrong, I don't want to misrepresent you, you're a straw man. So if I, okay. if I say something that's wrong, and you can say, I don't believe that. I just know what I've discussed with other Church of Christ uh, proponents before, and I know what they believe. So you may, you may gotcha. be different, maybe. Go ahead. But, so connect the keys, you mean it, it includes baptism, confession, repentance, and belief. Correct. Is that all that it includes, according to your view? Um, there could be a question of remaining faithful. Again, that's another debate, whether remaining faithful unto death and to receive that crown of life, what that means. But as far as initial salvation is concerned, we're talking about belief, repentance, confession, and I say water baptism according to the text and the natural understanding of the word baptism. Okay. Um, and I'll ask one more and I'll give you a chance to ask me some. Um, Go ahead. Where is in the Bible is one scripture that says that it includes all those four steps? There wouldn't be one verse. I gave different verses that mention repentance alone. No, not the phrase repentance alone. I'm saying that only mention repentance, that only mention confession, that only mention baptism to also now save us. Um, so it's not, it doesn't have to be in one particular verse, but yet baptism is one of the only things that's mentioned in every conversion book of Acts as well. So it's not a weakness to say there's not one verse that says, believe, repent, confess, be baptized. Okay. Did you want to, you can ask me a question if you want. Or? Okay. I uh, want to get into Romans 10 instead of the, the repentance thing. Romans 10 um, what does it mean that with the mouth confession is made unto salvation? I've actually changed my view on that. So I used to believe that that was, that was a part of uh, salvation today, but actually it refers more to physical salvation to the Jews in the tribulation. But that's a, a whole other discussion. But I know that verse is typically used to refer to confession and confess and believe in Jesus Christ and all that. But actually that's, I changed my view on that, so I have a different view on it. Okay, and I'll acquiesce. Every time you read the word salvation, it doesn't necessarily mean right because um, that's the, that, that would be the illegitimate totality uh, transfer identity transfer would be a logical fallacy. Saying the same word means the same thing. Yeah, so that's good. You see, okay, that. okay. Um, so let me ask you. Uh, you said Jesus. It was a silly argument to say that Jesus didn't baptize anybody. Um, so let me ask you, obviously you don't believe Jesus was silly, right? No. Um, Jesus didn't use that argument. Jesus didn't say, oh, I didn't baptize anyone, so it's not essential for salvation. Um, it's just the argument. Um, whether he baptized anyone or not does not answer the question. Whether... Um, 
So, uh, so if, if baptism is necessary for salvation, why didn't Jesus baptize anybody? Why did he always tell them, believe, believe, believe? Well, he doesn't believe for different reasons. Sometimes he's telling them to believe um, to trust because they would receive a healing, and that's a different context than uh, the salvation right. context that we see outside of the Gospels. No, nah, I'm just talking uh, about salvation context. I mean, if, if okay. you take like when Jesus said, he who believes in me has everlasting life. Is that a true statement or a false statement? I believe it's a true statement, but it's not belief only. It's not faith only, according to my view. And I don't see that in scripture either. Where do, you, where do we see that he, that uh, the connect the key when Jesus said, he who believes in me has everlasting life. It's just a true statement. Then that actually defeats your argument because he who believes yeah. is saved. He didn't say be baptized, confess, pray a sinner's prayer, walked on none of these other things. So I just, I failed to see how that uh, represents uh, that. Oh, let me, let me walk through this. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. It's one of those, why do you call Jesus Lord and not do what he says? If he says belief and baptism are necessary for salvation, then why do we not believe that? You're not going to be baptized for their mission of sins unless you recognize that, uh, see that in the text and accept it. It's not a matter of, well, that means all you have to do is believe. Like, if you don't believe, you're not going to change your life. You're not going to repent. You're not going to, um, and again, some of these things are getting outside the initial salvation, but uh, are you going to confess in someone you don't believe in? Are you going to be baptized in someone you don't believe in? Um, I could use an analogy if you'll permit me. Or is that too much for that question? No, no, go ahead. I, I'm, I'm listening. Uh, this is something I borrowed from a Baptist minister because it kind of disproves his point. Um, whoever gets in the car and buckles their seatbelt will go to Chicago. Um, and it's very similar to arguments that have been used for the past 50, 70 years. But um, you can say getting in the car is the most important thing, but you have two conditions. You have he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Whoever gets in the car and buckles their seatbelt will go to Chicago. And it's not a matter of, you know, you'll exit the vehicle or that. That's another discussion. It's just you have two conditions to meet before you have this um, reach the final uh, state or the final destination. So to say that it's just belief, well, belief is the important first step of the process. And people are going to balk at that idea of process. But, you know, belief is the start. Belief is where you begin. And if you have not been baptized for the remission of sins, then that's not a scriptural belief. I'm not saying you specifically. I'm just saying in general, based on the proper exegesis of the text. Okay, so why didn't, but why doesn't John uh, connect baptism with belief, the gospel of John? That's why doesn't the book of, he go ahead. Why doesn't the book of Hebrews um, mention eternal security? Um this well, is not the point. The point that, is, that's where are these not nine my question. You didn't answer my question. Why doesn't the Gospel of John connect baptism and belief together? Um, well, we What's can argue over question? John three. Uh, well, we can argue over John three, and we'll have a subjective view of what it's actually mean or what the water is. And many of the verses that I refer to don't necessarily mention water; they just mention baptism, because that was one thing that did strike my ear kind of weird. But uh, I'll ask you a question in return, though. If the book of Hebrews never mentions eternal security, does that mean that's a false doctrine? You should reject it. No, but that's eternal security is a whole other subject, though. We could get into that, too. But Okay. Well, just different... because John doesn't, just because even if John doesn't mention baptism, even if born of water doesn't literally mean born of water, then if it's elsewhere in Scripture and it's the Word of God and the Word of God's authoritative, then whether it's mentioned in the Gospel of John or the eight. 13 verses in the book of Jude is beside the point. Are you it's, saying that water in John 3, 3 is, is, is a water baptism? I take it literally because that's a rule of hermeneutics. You take things literally until you have reason to say otherwise. I believe okay. water means water. I believe spirit means spirit. But I really, I know we're going to get into that. And it'll be subjective as far as how we look at that and how we interpret it. And I think there's clearer passages that we can spend time on, but. But but are you are you saying are you saying in John three that the water there refers to water baptism? That are, is that what you're you have you interpreted? 
Well, if it refers to literal water, it would have to be a water baptism. Why, that would be well, the only thing that would make sense to bring why does, why does, before. Why is the Greek word baptizo or baptize not used? See, yeah, it, it sounds like you're committing the illegitimate totality identity transfer. You're assuming because it mentions water, it's referring to baptism. That's not the case. If you look well, at the context, Jesus says, "What spirit, spirit; what flesh, is flesh." Well, there has to. He's talking about a second birth. In order to be a second birth, there has to be a first birth. Because if you go back and look at that context, the Jews thought that they didn't have to be born again because they were. Seeds of Abraham. They were born Jews. They didn't need to be born again. Jesus says, "No, you have to be. You have to have a spiritual rebirth." And it says there in the context, if you look, what's flesh is flesh, what's spirit spirit, and uh, it, it plainly tells you that. And, and the water there. Now, there's a different interpretations. Some say water baptism. Uh, some say it's the water referring to the Holy Spirit, refreshing of the Holy Spirit, renewing the Holy Spirit. Others say that it's talking about the amniotic fluid. During the first physical birth, that's what I would say it was because flesh, referring to flesh, and in the context, he's talking about spirit, a second birth. So you have the first birth, the water, and then you have the second birth, which is the Holy, the Holy Spirit birth. And I okay, think that can be seen in the context. But if I assume and make a practical hermeneutical assumption that we're talking about literal water and literal spirit, um, what sort of literal water is involved in that birth. And I think the only thing that you can see elsewhere in Scripture that's involved in the new birth would be baptism, the washing of regeneration with the renewing of the Holy Spirit. It's not baptism to the exclusion of the Spirit, just like I read in Colossians and what I read in Romans. It's the washing of regeneration, renewal of the Holy Spirit, washing in water of water by the Word. Well, I mean, just in that context. Just, just in, in the context of John 3? Yeah. Well, there's no reason to restrict it to that context, but um, I don't think it's clear from this, that passage. That's why we have to look at the whole counsel of God to determine uh, what it could be referring to, what it is talking about. I don't know any other verse that talks about amniotic fluid or um, you have to exist before you can choose to be saved or anything like that. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't have to say that. If you look at the context, he's talking about, again, he's talking about two, he's talking about two births. The first birth refers to the water. The second refers to the spirit. Okay. So in that case, if you're saying, well, here's the thing. If you're saying that that is water baptism, then you've got to say water baptism precedes faith. You see how that doesn't work. No, it wouldn't necessarily have to be water in order. first. He was born of water and of the spirit. So, so if it's no. water baptism, you got to be baptized first, and then believe. Okay, so the question should be: um, Doesn't one come before the other? And with the coordinating conjunction in the Greek language, absolutely not. We can't look to um, Mark sixteen and say, you know, belief comes before bapt uh, belief comes before baptism, or baptism comes before belief, because it's a coordinating conjunction. We believe belief comes before baptism because of the examples that you gave on your slides and elsewhere in Scripture. That's why elsewhere in Scripture, uh, regarding the same context, informs us as how to interpret that. Does belief come before baptism or not? You can't say it just in the word order in the Greek because it's a coordinating conjunction. But you say, you know, I believe Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Max 8, and then he goes down into the water and he comes out rejoicing. But so it's not a matter of word order. In John, he, sorry, in John 3, let me if, if, clarify. Okay. In John 3, just because born of water comes before born of spirit doesn't mean it's it's one before the other. But she just in, in that particular order. Just, no, I did not. Mark 16. Let's go back to Mark 16. Let me. Let me That's fine. Up. If we can here, let's camp out here for just a minute. Let me, let me just pull it up here just one second. I feel like time's flying by. We're just barely getting, we're just barely touch on this. Absolutely. Okay. Now Mark 16. Okay. Um, if you want to pull it up on your side, you can there. Uh, I've got it pulled up where I can see it. He who, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. That is a true statement, but I have proven that belief still occurs before baptism, which means through the belief faith alone, the person's already saved because 
And you add, oh, you mentioned about where does it say believer's baptism? It doesn't have to say this is believer's baptism. It plainly applies it there in the text because if you believe, you get baptized. Believer's baptism. This right there in verse 16. Now, notice what the next verse says, but he who does not believe will be condemned. If your view is correct, why doesn't the text say he who does not believe and he who is not baptized will be condemned? I don't you don't see how that's a, that's a fallacy there. I don't believe it's a fallacy, no matter how many times you say it. Um, the first part is he that believes is about to be saved. The second part is he that does not believe will be condemned. We both agree belief comes before the baptism. Um, belief is a prerequisite for baptism. Therefore, anyone who doesn't believe in the true scriptural sense is not going to be baptized. It's not a negative inference fallacy. Uh, well, actually, it is because if it, it would, the text would have to still say, "He who does not believe will be condemned, and he who is not baptized will be condemned." Because the first part of it says, "He who believes and baptized will be saved." He who does not believe will be condemned. And I also quoted several verses in John: "If you don't believe, you're, you're condemned." The baptism doesn't come into play there at all. No, I gave you the analogy: get in the car and go to Chicago, and buckle your seatbelt to go to Chicago. But if you don't get in the car, you're not going to Chicago. That doesn't mean you don't have to buckle your seatbelt. That doesn't mean buckling your seatbelt is not a second condition. That's not a fallacy. Mm, if you use I, that analogy. not the best illustration because you can still get in the car and not wear a seatbelt and still get there. Not if that's a condition set by the owner and, and that's, just, that's just nitpicking. That's nitpicking well, the analogy. I mean, it's not, it, if it's, both are conditions, not a, it's whether we have two conditions or not, or a number of conditions. But in is this passage, or is though, four? but in this passage, let's go back to the passage and not deal okay. with illustrations. Um, no. There's no mention of baptism uh, as far as it's not connected to condemnation. Condemnation is a lack of belief. If the text plainly says that, it never says anything about believers that have not been baptized. The text says belief and baptism are both necessary for salvation. They come before salvation. Okay. Do you understand what a negative inference fallacy is? I understand. Well, I have a good understanding of what a neg negative inference fallacy is. I know this isn't one of them because it doesn't work in the analogy. Well, if a statement you come up with an analogy, come up with an analogy that is analogous. Well, I, well, to I'm, trying, I'm trying to teach you something. If you listen, you'll learn. Okay. <laughs> A negative inference right. fallacy is this. If a statement is true, we cannot assume that all negations or opposite of that statement are also true. Now, for example, the statement a dog with brown spots is an animal is true. However, the negative, if a dog does not have brown spots, it's not an animal, is false. So in the same way, he who believes and is baptized will be saved is true. However, uh, the statement he who believes but is not baptized will not be saved is an unwarranted assumption. And this is exactly the assumption made by those like yourself who support baptismal regeneration. It's false. It's not a negative inference fallacy. If you wrote out in formal logic, you'd have two conditions, belief and baptism. If these two things, then salvation. If there's no belief, there's no salvation. If there's no baptism, there's no salvation either. If you construct it that way, it's not a negative inference. It is because the text doesn't say that. The text never says that. But we can move on. I don't think we're getting anywhere with that. Absolutely. Can I ask you some questions about? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. We're going to get about Luke twenty four. Nineteen minutes left. Okay. I want to. I want to spend some time in Luke twenty four, and get this Holy Spirit baptism. So Wait. Where are you? We'll try to look it up on my end here. Sorry, Luke twenty four, starting at verse forty seven ish. About six, seven verses from the end of the chapter. Luke, where are you? What verse? Luke 24. I'll start in verse 46 just to have the complete. And he said to them, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. So based on verse 49, what is the promise of my Father? He's talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 
and that, that takes what? place in Acts chapter 2 because uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit did not take place in the Old Testament because there was no church. Uh, the church was started in Acts chapter 2. Now, I'm a dispensationalist, so I'm going to argue for um, the church starting in Acts 2. I believe so, too, yeah. Because, because he says, I father... will send, he says there, I send the promise of my father upon you, tarry the city of Jerusalem until you are due with power. Well, obviously, now, there was a transition period here, so let's mention that for our Pentecostal and charismatic friends because, you know, they still want to say it's that way for today. No, it was that way here. There was a transition because Jesus was still on the earth. He had to send the Holy Spirit. When he, it, his, as I mentioned, he ascended. He sent the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit came upon these people who are already believers, but there was a transition. Now, as, as you go yeah. on through the remainder of Acts, you see that there was no, there was no transition. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, uh, it was linked with salvation. What does the phrase mean, being endued with power from on high, and when was that fulfilled? Acts chapter 2. Endued with on high just is a reference to the Holy Spirit. If you go back to Acts chapter 2 and read through that whole event of what took place, power from on high obviously is power from, from God, power from heaven, power of the Holy Spirit uh, that was used uh, so they could carry out the Great Commission. How did that power come upon them in Acts 2, and how did they use it, as you said? I need some clarification there. How did it come upon them? Well, I mean, if you go back and read Acts 2, it tells you. At what part of Acts 2? I need to know what part of Acts 2 you're referring let to. Me, let, me, let me pull it up here so I can't, I can't quote it from memory. That's fair. Okay, let me just read Acts... Huh? Go ahead. Uh, when the day of Pentecost had ahead. fully come, they were all in one accord, one place, certainly there came a sound from heaven, rushing mighty wind. It filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues, which were languages, as a fire, and one set upon each one of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak with other tongues, and the Spirit gave them utterance. So then if you go through and read, uh, and of course, well, we, we could always talk about with the tongues for today. That's another argument. But uh, if you go through and read, this was going to be the fulfillment of what Jesus, this is the fulfillment of what Jesus just predicted in the verse you asked me about. Were they unsaved before they received the Spirit? No, they were saved. But as I pointed out, this was a transition. This was a transitional period. We don't have a transition between the baptism of the Spirit and, and salvation now because there's no transitional period. It's already been met. So what did the what did them receiving the Holy Spirit do in those four verses? If they were already saved, what did it um, accomplish? Well, now, but see, I know where you're going with this. You're trying you're trying to say that baptism is not a part of salvation. In this context, he gave them power to do what God called them to do. But if you go, if you read the Book of Acts and later verses, the Holy Spirit was received the same time as salvation. If you under, I mean, do you understand that the Book of Acts is a transitional book? Okay, well, that's not necessarily the case. In Acts 8, you have people believing and being baptized, and then later on, they receive the Holy Spirit in a miraculous context. And that's Well, where they... again, they were still, if you take, I don't know what you're talking about, Acts 2, Acts 8, Acts 10, and Acts 19. Those are the four transitional periods. But I mean, we could get into a whole discussion on the book of Acts and reception of the Holy Spirit and all that, but I don't, I don't know where you want to go with this, but and how it relates to yeah, baptism. Probably... It's probably your turn to answer the question. I've, I've asked enough questions about baptism of the Holy Spirit for a minute, but I'll, I want to come back to it if we have time. Uh, my turn to ask a question? Yeah, go ahead and ask some questions. I've asked a few. Okay. Um, let me go back to, let me find my question. Sorry, give me just a second here. Oh, you're fine. Uh, okay. Let me pull up my, find my list. Um Okay. Uh, well, I mean, since we're on the subject, I mean, I'll just kind of, I'll kind of hang here for a minute if it's okay. Acts ten forty four through forty eight. Cornelius right. was a recipient of a recipient of the Holy Spirit prior to his baptism. So there you have a verse that says he believed and he had the Holy Spirit prior to his baptism. How do you explain that? I make a distinction, like we see in Acts eight, between receiving a miraculous gift or a healing or whatever 
and salvation. I don't understand so, what you mean. What, explain what you mean. I can clarify. Um, there were people that were healed that did not have faith, that were not saved. Jesus healed 10 lepers, only one of them returned. Um, now, I'm not saying they had faith or not, but receiving the ability to speak in tongues is being is receiving power from on high. It's not receiving salvation. In that context, in Acts 2, it is. But there's still a, a spiritual baptism. The, the Bible talks about we were all baptized. First Corinthians says we're all baptized into one spirit and made to drink of the same spirit. Baptized into one body and made to drink of one spirit. Yeah, yeah, Again, exactly. I believe, so, I believe, but I believe that's a water baptism and a spiritual component. Oh, no, that's that a spiritual us. baptism. I mean, that's, that's I would that's, disagree. That's, I know we disagree on that. I'm just saying what what supports your view of that. Well, let's pull up the verse. Let me pull up the verse here. Let's see here. Give me just a second here to pull it up. Just one second. Let me. Okay. All right, for for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we're Jews, Gentiles, whether we're bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. And of course, metaphorically, just because you see the word drink does not necessarily mean it's talking about water baptism. That, that would be a, a fallacy. Drink of the spirit there means you receive the Holy Spirit when you're saved. If there's a spiritual baptism there, and uh, as far as being united into one body, he's talking about spiritual transformation, united together, because that's what Christ did. He sent the Holy Spirit to unite the church as one whole uh, group of people, uh, whether they're Jews, Greeks, whoever, they brought, they're brought together in one spiritual sphere or one spiritual element. Can I ask you a question? Just a simple yeah. question. Why can't the spiritual baptism take place during the physical water baptism? During that? Because no verse yes. says no. There's no verse that says that. Well, th that just depends on your interpretation. If we're looking at washing of regeneration and, but again, we're, but even, we're even if it did, even, but see, that's read, that's inferring into the, uh, the text. Even if it did, even even the baptism, the spirit baptism did. It doesn't mean that water was a part of that because spiritually, it's something that happens on the inside. Water baptism is something that happens on the outside. Okay, I've heard that distinction before, but that never mind. Go ahead and ask another question. Um, all right, let me get back to my other page here. Okay, let's see. Okay, how do you explain when Jesus said? Uh, you know, of course, now, do you believe baptism is a work? And by work, I'm talking about stuff we do. I'm not talking about, because I, I know in your last debate, you talked about the different, how the word works was used. And I'm not talking right. about and all that. I'm talking about us. In Mark 16, 16, belief is active. Uh, be baptized is passive. So, um there may be some indication that it is nothing we do based on that. Um, that seems disingenuous. If we do say it is a work, it is a work of God and no different than Jesus calling faith a work. And we can go over that if we need to, but I think time wouldn't permit. Um, all right, let me ask you. Um, Titus 3, 5 and Matthew three sixteen. Okay. Uh, salvation is not by works of righteousness, which we have done. But yet Jesus right. says that, ma that uh, baptism is a work of righteousness. So with that said, how can water baptism be a part of salvation? If we're saying by grace, trees. and grace doesn't involve human effort or merit. Does, well, I can't ask you, I can't ask a question. I can't answer a question with a question, but, um, you said Matthew three sixteen, um, yes, or fifteen three fifteen I think, and Titus three five. Well, Matthew three fifteen says, "Permit it to be so, for thus it's fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness." It doesn't call it a work of righteousness. 
but it's still it's still referring to righteousness. So, but my point is, uh, how can water baptism, according to that verse, be a part of salvation? If, if Titus three five says this, it says it's not by works of righteousness we have done or any of that. Then how how is it? How is uh, baptism because, something that's because saved? I believe. I believe the washing of regeneration is water baptism. The renewal of the Holy Spirit occurs at baptism. It's not so much about baptism being how you're saved. It's baptism being the point that you're saved. Uh, you fully submitted to the gospel. Then why doesn't that text say baptism? Water baptism is not mentioned. Because if you look at all these texts together and in context in the whole council of God, it fits together that we're talking about water baptism in the Great Commission and there's no reason to say otherwise. There's no argument that anyone can provide to say against that interpretation. Well, I mean, I don't. I, it doesn't mention baptism, so there, there's the argument. It just, it doesn't use the word baptizo. It doesn't say baptized. Just because it mentions water, washing, things of that nature, it, that commits the logical fallacy again. Do you uh, believe it's the Holy Spirit baptism? That for, washing of regeneration is the Holy Spirit baptism. In Titus yeah. three five, yeah, that's that's a way to refer doesn't... to it. Yeah. Okay. Well, then your argument's invalid because it doesn't say it's Holy Spirit baptism. It doesn't. It doesn't. Say it, doesn't ha baptism. it doesn't have to, because the Holy it Spirit's doesn't... the one that does the washing. It's not you. Okay. Do, okay. So let me ask you: Do you wash yourself when you get baptized, or does the per the person giving you the baptism, performing the baptism, do they wash you? Neither. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that that cleanses us, that washes our sins away. But baptism is a physical element. Water is a physical element. The Holy Spirit is spiritual. So how do you okay. how do you tie the Holy Spirit with water? It's not tied to the water. It's tied to the faith and the obedience. That, that's it. It's that simple. So you would say by obedience, is that a work or not a work? If it is a court, if it's obedience to a command of Christ, it is by faith, and therefore it is not a work. If Christ says believe, you believe. If Christ says you repent, you repent. You are confessed, you be baptized. Those are all obedience to the command. Those are all through faith, through grace, even. It's not a it's not denying grace or denying faith. It's affirming what Jesus and the apostles are saying about. Baptism, saving, washing sins away, the washing of regeneration, or whatever verse you want to look at. Okay, um, let's see. Let me give you uh, some time. To ask. I think you like five minutes. Wow, this is flying by. If you want to ask me a question, you can. If you want to ask me something. Okay. Um, so we were in Acts 10 earlier. Now in Acts 11... Peter's referring to what happened to Cornelius' household. Um, Acts eleven fifteen. Can you? Are you there? Let me let me just. Tie, I'm gonna pull it up here. Hang on a second. Okay. Okay. So verse fifteen. As I begin to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as upon us at the beginning. Um. Then I remembered how the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Um, what's the beginning he's referring to there, in your opinion? In verse 15, where he talks about, um, yeah. as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit. Oh, he's referring back to Pentecost. Right. But then he, but then he goes on to say, John baptized with water, but you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. But then he says, in verse 17, because it's just a transitional book, he says, if God gave them the same gift he gave us who believed the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? So he's talking about uh, his experience with the Holy Spirit, of course, but you got to keep in mind it's, it's a transitional book. But notice he says okay. God gave them the same gift. What? The gift of the Holy Spirit. When we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. I thought the gift that they were given was the ability to speak in tongues at the beginning of Acts 2. So would it be more consistent to say they receive the power to speak in tongues, the miraculous power to speak in tongues. They receive the same gift as they did from the beginning. Um, why would he point that out if, again, if every Christian received the baptism of the Holy Spirit for the past 10 years? 
That's a loaded question. I'll, I'll just let you answer it. Why would he point one out? Why is he saying, oh, they received this just like we did from the beginning? You're, you believe baptism of the Holy Spirit happens at every single conversion. Why is he pointing that out? That it's because, just like it happened at the beginning. Again, because it's a transitional book. It's the transition because the Holy Spirit didn't baptize anybody spiritually prior to what happened in Acts 2. And then following Acts 2, you get into Acts 3, you get into verses like this when you believe the Holy Spirit baptizes believers spiritually. Okay. Uh, do you have a question? Uh, golly, we only got like two minutes. We've got, you know, we're going to do this again. You know, you realize that? <laughs> That's how it goes. The time okay, is just not enough to get probably, to the, the bare bones of everything. We got like two minutes, two two minutes and ten seconds. Um, let me see what I want to ask real quick. Um, so would you say in the New Testament there are references to unbaptized sinners um, that appear to have been saved? For example, the demon-possessed person, Mark 5, 1 through 20, Luke 8, 26 through 39, a Samaritan woman. Would you say they were saved or lost? You said they were unbaptized, but were they saved or lost? Right, yeah, they were unbaptized, but according to the text, they were saved because they had believed, but it doesn't say they were baptized. So would you say anything, they were saved or lost? Anything in the gospel accounts before the death, burial, and resurrection, before the Great Commission, would be, the, in, in a way, similar to, um, similar to the Old Testament. I think the Gospels are more transitional than the Book of Acts is. The Book of Acts gives us, um, well, aside from miraculous gifts, because we both agree on that, but I believe the Book of Acts gives us um, not necessarily a transition outside of that miraculous context. I think it gives us a clearer understanding of what the Gospel is and what it involves. So do you see the Gospel of John as the book that leads people to faith in Christ? I don't think it's any book of the Bible alone. I believe it's the entirety of the New Testament that um, we'll have to look at to determine the truth of any particular topic. There's a context in the book. There's a context in the past chapter. There's a yeah, context I understand throughout that, the Old actually, Testament. New Testament, sorry. Uh, the Gospel of John actually testifies to that very fact. That that's, what it's, that's what it's there for. Uh, so you would continue to believe that Jesus Christ or believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God and for salvation. So it actually gives its own testimony. So um, I got nine seconds. So I guess I'll, I'll stop right there because we time's up. Gentlemen, great discussion. Uh, 50, 50 ish minutes has flown by. And so it's the kind of topic, it, it, it's a comprehensive topic. And so there's a lot to discuss. There's a lot of passages to engage. And so I think you both did a, a good job e engaging most of the uh, relevant points and passages brought up in the openings and rebuttals. So we do have closing statements. And in the closing statements, we can wrap up our thoughts and points, address anything we feel might be uh, left hanging. And Gavin, since you started us off with your opening, let's give you the floor for the first closing statement. You've got five minutes. Whenever you're ready, Gavin, the floor is yours. Um, I feel the question is still uh, looming. When we look to these nine passages of scripture, uh, that refer to baptism or things associated with baptism, and, and each of them is different. Um, what baptism are we talking about? Um, I don't see an inconsistency in saying that there are verses that mention the importance of faith and believing, the importance of repentance, the importance of confession, and the importance of baptism, but I also think there's also a necessity, and a necessity of water baptism. Um and my own journey in understanding this and coming to terms with this, um, how can anyone say that I've been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, if they have not been, again, planned together in the likeness of his death, in water baptism, to arise and walk news of life and have that hope of resurrection? Um, I don't want to uh, spend too much time on the passages we didn't talk about, what we didn't see, but I think it's important to point out, and 
I understand I'm in the minority view on this as far as uh, many, many of the viewers or many people around uh, different movements and traditions and denominations. But uh, walking through what the Bible says explicitly about baptism of the Holy Spirit outside the Gospels in Luke and in Acts, um, there's nothing that points to that being a salvific act, doing anything other than um, them receiving the ability to speak in tongues. Um, there are many assumptions that go into that. Well, if they receive this miraculous gift, if this happened or this miracle occurred, uh, they must have been saved before. Or if they believe before they were baptized, they must have been saved. Again, these are all assumptions uh, that don't necessarily prove anything one way or the other. And we have to get these things in the proper context, the proper understanding, so we might know uh, what the true gospel is, how to believe it, and how to obey it. Um, so again, it is by grace. What was given to us by grace? I believe it's the word of God was given to us by grace. The New Testament is given to us um, as Christians. Uh, we have the commands of Christ. We have the examples. We have the words of the apostles. Um, now we can spend some more time trying to determine what they're saying, what these things mean. But I also believe it was given to us by grace. Uh, through faith, through the word of God, we can understand what is necessary for salvation. I believe that includes faith, repentance, confession, and baptism. Uh, we'll probably get a lot more of that in the question and answer. Um, it's not the exclusion of Christ. It's not baptism instead of Christ. It's not uh, baptism instead of Jesus' blood. Um, all these things can be united in our understanding of the gospel given to us by grace through faith. Um, and I'll just leave everything else to the to question and answer. I've, uh, that's my concluding statement. Gavin, thank you very much for that concluding statement. We'll now hand it over to John. Whenever you're ready, I've got five minutes on the clock for you. Go ahead. You're concluding. <clears throat> oh, okay. Uh, concluding statement, the Bible is very clear, as I have pointed out. I mean, unless you just totally want to ignore the evidence. Is baptism necessary for salvation? I think I have proven, the scriptures have proven, no. Now, I have, we didn't get a lot of time to get into a lot of the various passages. There's at least nine. We didn't have enough time. We could do a whole show on just one passage, probably. Maybe we could do that again if God wants to engage again on that. I'll be glad to do it. But the Bible is clear that we are saved by faith alone. Abraham was saved by faith. We're saved by faith alone. The scriptures are replete, full of evidence to prove that. More than 200 verses. Romans 4, 1 through 25. Galatians 3, 6 through 22 talk about that. Ephesians uh, 8 talks about that. Um, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, rather. Uh, throughout the Bible, in every dispensation, people have been saved without being baptized. Every believer in the Old Testament was uh, saved. Um, without baptism, just like people in the New Testament were saved, then they were baptized to follow up as an act of discipleship. You see, the whole thing about saying that baptism is part of salvation confuses discipleship with salvation. One is spiritual birth. One has to do with spiritual growth. One is salvation. One is discipleship. Uh, one is being born again. One is following Christ through baptism. Uh, to identify with Christ publicly, to make a public declaration or a profession of faith that you have already believed uh, in Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us we have eternal life the moment we believe, John 5, 24. Belief always comes before baptism. Uh, baptism does not save us any more than walking an aisle, saying a prayer, a sinner's prayer, uh, praying with a preacher, doing a good work, whatever these things, whatever you want to throw in there. And the Bible never says that if one is not baptized, he's, he's not saved. The Bible never says that. The basis for condemnation is a lack of belief, as I've proved over and over. Uh, and if baptism were required for salvation, then no one could be saved without another party being present. I pointed that out. Someone's got to be there to baptize a person before he or she can, can be saved, if you hold to that, as Gavin does. This limits those who can be saved and not be saved. Um, and I, I didn't get a chance to ask about those that are on their deathbed. Can they receive Christ? They can't get baptized, but they can receive Christ by faith. But according to his view, he probably said, no, they would go to hell, I would think. Throughout the Bible, we see that a point of faith, a believer possesses all the promises and blessings of salvation. 
John 1, 12, 3, 16, 5, 24, 6, 47, uh, John 20, 31, Acts 10, 43, Acts 13, 39, Acts 16, 31. It's all through the scripture. That to be saved, one must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and trust in him for what he did. When he was on the cross, he cried out, it is finished. He didn't say, well, I partially completed it and you've got to do some things here to add to what I did. No, that's complete blasphemy and would be a smack on the, in the face of Jesus. So clearly we can see from the scriptures that you believe in Christ and then later up, later on you follow up with baptism. Now, the, of course, the book of Acts, they took you out right then and baptized you because baptism was close to salvation. That doesn't mean if someone wasn't baptized, they weren't saved. If someone's saved, they should get baptized. Water baptism is very important. I'm not, I'm not trying to belittle baptism. So don't accuse me of that. Don't say, put in the comments on here, so he doesn't believe in baptism. That is not true. I do. I don't believe it's necessary for salvation. You should be saved first, and then you should be baptized because it's a command of discipleship to follow Christ and begin to live and walk in his way. The water passages of the New Testament do not teach the necessity of baptism for receiving salvation. None of those passages that were brought up uh, mentioned baptism, as I pointed out there in our uh, discussion. Numerous passages, I mean, several of them, we don't have time to mention, where salvation is presented, baptism is not even mentioned, preferably the Gospel of John. So I'll go ahead and, and stop right there. That concludes my closing statements. All right, John, thank you very much for that five-minute concluding statement. That concludes the concluding statement. So a great debate. Gentlemen, on an important topic, is a water baptism necessary for our salvation? We've also had a lively chat. So we've got uh, a lot of uh, engagement in our live audience, which is always good because we've got some uh, fantastic questions for the both of you. So real quick, I will give the audience a reminder and therefore give the debaters here just a quick 30 second break. We, uh, for the summer, we've been putting on about four to five shows a week. It's a mix of debates, interviews, open mics, so on and so forth on all different topics. And so uh, this week we've had a lot of uh, great shows. Uh, last night we had a uh, very interesting debate between Pastor Scott Clem, Mark White. So if you haven't yet seen this one, please do check it out. Is there a ge uh, geopolitical future for national Israel? So check that one out tonight. Of course, we had the uh, great baptism debate. And next week, we've got another four debates for everybody. And so we'll be starting the week off on Monday with an open mic debate night. Uh, this will be specifically on evolution, the age of the earth. Uh, those related topics, um, myself, Sam, Kent, and Matt. So we'll all be here uh, hosting and engaging. And so if you are uh, of the evolution persuasion, make sure to uh, join us and engage in some dialogue. Uh, we've got three more shows as well next week. One uh, that I'll give a quick shout out to. Uh, this will be an informal uh, debate, more of a discussion. Is there evidence for the existence of God? Michael, the Canadian atheist. And Paul Price uh, from Uncensored Pilgrims. And so uh, both of these gentlemen have engaged this uh, topic numerous times, whether it's in article form. Uh, Paul Price has written extensively for uh, creation.com. And Michael has uh, a podcast where he uh, hosts lots of these discussions. So that'll be next week on the 15th. Okay, Gavin and John. We are going to uh, get right into the questions. Gentlemen, I appreciate the work that you both put into uh, preparing for these debates. I understand how much work and time goes into these formal debates. And so, John and Gavin, I really do want to thank you for uh, the time you've given to us. All right, let's start right at the beginning. The nature of the Q&As, gentlemen. Uh, some of these questions are related to points that you've already engaged in the discussion, but this gives us the opportunity to elaborate and add anything. Okay, so let's start with the super chat. So uh, Anthony Aquino, thank you very much for the uh, super chat. Okay, so Anthony has a question and the question looks like it is for 
Uh, let's see. We'll work through it together. So, Anthony, question. At Saint for Truth, Acts 10, 44, Cornelius is with the Holy Spirit, like Peter in 10, 47. Okay, so it's a question for you, Gavin. Gavin, are hell-bound children of the devil in this moment possessing the third person of the Trinity? Yeah, I think I saw that comment. I appreciate it. Weird. Um, it doesn't say anything about the Holy Spirit being possessed. All we have is a sort of miraculous event where they were able to speak in tongues. Um, to say that there was a possession or an indwelling is, I think, an assumption not warranted by the text. Okay, thank you, Gavin. John, floor is yours. Oh, John, looks like you're on mute. I'm going to unmute you. John, you're good. If you could re um, <laughs> reiterate the last 10 seconds. Go ahead. Can you hear me now? Okay. Is, yeah, I, I don't understand his question there. Is he saying that those people are hellbound? Is that what he's the person asking the question? I think I can clarify. He sure, go ahead. thinks they're hellbound. In my position, they would be hellbound and unsaved, but still possess uh, the third person of the Trinity. No, he's, because... I would say that's an emphatic no. You, an unbeliever can't possess or have the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit um, and, not, and not be saved and be able to speak in tongues and be able to do the things that, that through the power of the Holy Spirit that's going on. Um, now, it is true that people can be demon-possessed and speak in other languages. That's true. But in the context here, no, the person was not hell-bound. They obviously had to have the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit to be able to do the miraculous works that they did. Thank you, John. Gavin, did you want a quick final word since the question was for you? Yeah, like I said, I don't, I think we're taking it too far by saying, oh, they were able to speak in tongues. This miracle was wrought upon them by the Holy Spirit. Uh, power was giving them from on high by the Holy Spirit. To say that there was an indwelling or a possession or salvation is just not what the text is saying up to that point. Okay, thank you, Gavin. Next question comes in from Church Phone 1611. Thank you for the question. Question for Gavin. 1 Corinthians 117. Why did Paul say, for Christ sent me not to baptize? If baptism is essential for salvation, why did Christ not send Paul to baptize? All right. I think we have to look at the context. If Jesus linked belief and baptism to salvation, Paul is not uh, tearing asunder what God has joined together. So um, in verse 13, he says, as Christ divided, was Paul crucified for you or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Um, so clearly Paul was not sent to baptize in his own name, just like Cephas or Apollos were not sent to baptize in their own name. They were sent to baptize uh, these individuals into Christ to teach them the gospel so that they might uh, believe and obey it. Thank you, Gavin, for the response. John, go ahead. Floor is yours. Well, I think uh, this is a question I actually mentioned or a statement I had made, I believe, in the beginning. No, uh, the text plainly says Christ is not something to baptize. Why? Because baptism is not a part of the gospel. The gospel, Paul tells us, is Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And the power, Romans 1 16, to save those that believe. So baptism is not a part of the gospel, or else he would have said, he wouldn't have made that statement, Christ did not send me to baptize. What did he send him to do? To preach the gospel, to preach the true gospel. So that's where I stand. Gavin, if you'd like a final word, it was your question. Go ahead. I think we just have to look at the context, um, not to baptize in Paul's name, but to baptize into Christ. And that's what. Um, from other passages of scripture, we would see clearly that that's what the gospel is. Okay, so, thank you, it. Gavin and John. Next question comes in from Pseudo Nim. $2 super chat. Thank you very much. Question for John. John 3 5. John, it's a question about John. John 3 5. Are you saying waters and not water? Question mark. And then he's also got John 1 33. Uh, I mentioned what I, what my interpretation of that was. The water refers to the first birth. So in that sense, it is water. And yes, I would say it, it's not like water, like physical water baptism. No, it doesn't say that. It doesn't use the word baptizo. It doesn't say baptize. 
It's referring clearly to the first birth because in the context, Jesus says what's flesh is flesh, what's spirit is spirit. The flesh refers to the first birth and the spirit refers uh, to the uh, second birth. Now, uh, John 1, 33. Let me pull that up here real quick. On my end. And I myself did not know him, but uh, the one who sent me to baptize with water told me the man. Yeah, he's talking about baptism here, obviously, in that context. But you can't equate that with what he's talking about in John 3, 3. That's serious eyes to Jesus. And uh, the text just doesn't warrant that. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, Gavin, floor is yours if there's anything you'd like to add. <clears throat> you know, I, I hate to bang this passage because everyone says it's a contrast. It's just these two things you need to do. It, it's, it's back and forth over what is going on in the text around it. I stick with the rule of hermeneutics. You assume things are literal until you have enough evidence to suggest otherwise. I believe water is water and spirit is spirit. I don't believe water is spirit or spirit is water, even though that'd be the same thing. Um, I don't know. I just, until I have enough um, of an argument and solid evidence from scripture to say otherwise, I believe water is water and spirit is spirit. Okay. Thank you, Gavin. John, you get the last word. Uh, that's all I have. Okay. All right. Let's move on to the next one. Looks like there's another, um, Super chat from pseudonym five dollars super chat. Thank you very much. Question for both. We'll work through this together. He says, I don't know if I don't know if was a clear answer why Jesus baptized himself through Paul. He clarified earlier. Let me see something. So he means John, not Paul. Any who did the Jews or Muslims baptize? Why would John practice if Christians are excluded? Does this um question if you guys understand it feel free to respond i i don't understand what he's asking <laughs> uh, did you have okay. any thoughts at all gavin i'm trying to parse it if i don't know if it was a clear answer oh the, i think he's asked the question why jesus was baptized by john the baptist and I don't understand the part about the Jews or the Muslims. I don't either. So that's kind of a weird, it's worded weird. I don't know. So I guess we can just understand it as why was Jesus baptized through John if baptism is not required? Well, let, let's start with you, John. Oh, well, first of all, obviously Jesus uh, was not, you know, John was the forerunner. Uh, of Jesus and G uh, John the Baptist was chosen by God, by Jesus to do that, to authenticate or to validate the ministry of Jesus. And as, as I mentioned in Matthew three eleven, I believe it was to fulfill all righteousness. And then that's when John said, I'm not worthy to even unlatch his shoes, but he will baptize with fire and the Holy spirit. So, but Jesus obviously was, he did that to inaugurate his ministry. It was the beginning of his ministry, and John, as the forerunner, uh, was chosen to do that, to participate in that. Okay, thank you, John. Gavin, any thoughts? Now, while Jesus is the exception, he had no sins to um, be cleansed of. Uh, Mark 1 4 says John was preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Uh, he was preaching to Israel. Uh, Jesus made it clear that that was a message from God. And Jesus' ministry was primarily focused on the lost sheep of the house of Israel and the baptism that his disciples performed. So, uh, in short, uh, no, this baptism didn't wash any sins away from Jesus because he had no sins to wash away. But I think the question becomes, if this is a message from God and Jesus is living under the law and all those things, um, would it be a sin if he did not uh, subject himself to it? And that could be a whole other debate just by itself, but... Um, I think it was something necessary to do so he would uh, be a sinless, perfect sacrifice. Gavin, appreciate it. Okay, next question comes in from Echoing Erudite. Question for Gavin. If baptism saves, then how could the Holy Spirit confirm Cornelius and those with him in Acts 10 before their baptism? I wish I could just make a 
three hour long video of just explaining this. It's not, the text doesn't say that what was being confirmed um, or that what they received or how they received it. It, it was not an indwelling, it was not a salvation. I personally believe, uh, based on uh, multiple reasons we could go into, um, what the Holy Spirit was confirming is that, I think the conclusion they reached in Acts 11, well, God has given the Gentiles uh, repentance unto life. They can be welcomed into the church. Who can forbid water? We can't forbid them. That was the point. That was the purpose. That was, we keep using the word transition period, but that was the purpose of that. Um, to welcome the Gentiles into the church. Nothing can be said against it because this event happened. Now, conflating that with salvation, just like we do, some people do in Acts 8 or other passages, is, I think, the key problem. We need to be careful about that. Thank you, Gavin. John, over to you. Well, I think we've already, I've already mentioned that, but I'll just say again, I'm, I'm repeating myself, but <clears throat> again, he was, uh, you know, the person here is using confirm but in other words he was he, he he did have a relationship with christ he had to be saved and then he was baptized or else he wouldn't have been baptized okay thank you john gavin if you'd like the last word go ahead and i think people need to go back to the beginning of chapter 10 um, cornelius sees a vision from god and we can compare that to like saul's vision of jesus on the road to damascus but he wasn't saved until he was uh, the gospel was preached to him because you not only need someone to baptize, you need someone to preach the gospel to you. That's, I think, uh, Romans 10, too. But um, just seeing a vision or being able to speak in tongues doesn't necessarily mean that he was saved. Um, and or you could argue he was based on the transition period and all that, but that's a whole other topic. Um, but again, that's not the purpose of the passage. That's not what the text is telling us. There's a lot of uh, assumptions and things going into the passage, and this is, oh, this is the nail in the coffin. They did this, therefore they were saved, but the text doesn't tell us that clearly. Okay, thank you, Gavin. All right, moving on. Question from Clint Little. The question is for John Crawford. If the Holy Spirit saves, why did the Spirit send a preacher to baptize the Ethiopian in Acts 8? Seems redundant based on your doctrine. It's not redundant. It's what the scripture says, <laughs> unless you're calling scripture redundant. Uh, again, it's, it's a transition. Uh, obviously, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You have to hear the word of God to be able to respond adequately to it. If you don't, that's why we're coming. How should they hear without a preacher? I mean, does this guy read his Bible? I mean, how, you have to have a preacher to communicate the word of God so people can adequately respond. So they can respond and say yes to Jesus, receive salvation and respond by faith alone in order to to be saved so yeah he had to have somebody to tell him that's the whole purpose of the book of acts jesus said i'll send you to all the uttermost parts of the earth judea samaria and all that. That's why so they could spread the gospel so so people could hear and be saved okay thank you john uh gavin floor is yours not to be unkind, but I think John just refuted his own argument. Um, do we need people to baptize people? Do we need people to preach the gospel? If we need people to come preach the gospel so they believe and accept it or uh, trust and obey it, then... Those people don't save um, you. I never said they did. That's not the point. Whether you're preaching the gospel, whether baptism saves or not, it's not the people, the baptism, or the water that saves you. But, uh, you anyway, know, no problem. Okay, thank you, Gavin. John, question was for you, to be fair, if you'd like the last word, go ahead. That's all I have. Okay, appreciate it. Next question comes in from SoCal Preston. Question for Gavin. How are you not teaching faith and works for salvation if, in fact, you believe we need to believe and be water baptized to be saved and OSAS is false? Gavin, go ahead. Again, the... I don't think once saved, always saved stands or falls based on what you view about this doctrine. You can believe, some people might believe baptism saves as part of the gospel and still believe in once saved, always saved. But, um, and we talked a lot more about works in my previous debate. I've made it clear. Jesus called believing in him a work of God. Uh, I believe, I trust in Thayer that that means his definition that is something that God says. It's a condition God sets for salvation. 
and I'm paraphrasing that horribly from my memory, but um, to say that, again, if Jesus commanded it and it is a condition for salvation, then it is not a work. It is what we do in response to uh, the word of God, the commands of Jesus, whether it's his own mouth or the words are in red or through the disciples, it is by faith. If the conditions are uh, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized, then we can't say that those are works or excluded from salvation. Clearly, if there are works that do not save, if these things are said to save in the scriptures, then they are not among that category of works. Okay, thank you very much, Gavin. John, floor is yours. Of course, that's where we disagree. I believe baptism is a work because it's something that uh, that we have to do in response. Now, we we are to obey the command, sure, but not in the sense of anything that say, that doesn't. So we can't save ourselves. And as far as believing being a work, which you're talking about in John 6, it says, this is the work of God that you may believe. Notice it's work, singular. It's not works, plural. Jesus was doing a play on words there. The question he was asked about what should we, what kind of work do we have to do to get saved or works? He says, you just have to believe. And Philippians tells us it was granted by God for us to be able to believe. He doesn't believe for us, but yes, we choose to believe, but that's not a work in the sense that he's trying to say or implying that baptism by being obedient, is it is a work if you say you're trusting in your baptism. And it's also interesting, and I don't know if this is Gavin's argument, but this is on an argument about eternal security. Most Church of Christ people that I know and have dialogued with teach the baptism is a part of salvation, or you, you're not saved until you're baptized. They don't believe in eternal security, but yet they don't go back and rebaptize anybody. Isn't that interesting? Okay, thank you, John. Gavin, floor is yours. You get the last word. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of surprised John 2, or sorry, James 2 hasn't come up yet. Um, Paul says that we're justified by faith. James says we're justified by works. What kind of works is he talking about? That's a whole other discussion. But if there are works of God that are we're told we have to do um, to have salvation, and whatever those might be, um, those are not works excluded from salvation. Those are the works that we must do. Um, and again, in obedience and submission, not of our own merit or anything, just taking it by faith, trusting it and obeying it. And um, I made it clear that baptism is a one time event. Um, you're washed, sanctified and justified in baptism. Um, then the Christian, as with Christ as our mediator, um, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Uh, yeah, there's no need to baptize again once a, whether once they've always said it's true or not, but um, that's what he would call discipleship. That's what he would call, you know, uh, the need to continue to believe, continue to repent and all that. But there's a lot to say about that. Okay, Gavin, thank you very much. Question was for you, so we'll give you the last word. Next question comes in from Mr. Pickles Channel. $10 Super Chat, thank you very much for the support and the question. So question... Uh, let's see who it's for as we read through it. If your grandparent believed and confessed Christ, but never got baptized, where are they now? Thank you both for a great debate. I agree, John and Gavin, excellent debate tonight. And so, uh, Gavin, go ahead. Oh, Gavin, I think you're on mute. Let me see if I think it's on your I, end. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. No problem. Um, again, if the conditions for salvation, if it's not just faith alone, if it's faith, repentance, confession, and baptism, and that is the gospel, then again, we should all be on board with it. Now, regardless of um, someone's grandparent or great grandparent, whether they believed all, whether they believe that or accepted it or obeyed it or not. Um, I don't pretend to say they're condemned or whatever, but if this is the gospel, if this has been the gospel for 2000 years, then um, if they don't obey that gospel and they don't know God and don't trust the word of God, then uh, there are negative consequences and those negative consequences are spelled out in the text. Thank you, Gavin. John, go ahead. First of all, if they, uh, if the person has believed at one point of time, They've truly trusted Christ and received Christ, and they die without getting baptized. Yes, I believe they're, they'll end up in heaven. Uh, however, if they uh, did believe and they put off baptism, I might question why. 
why did you not get baptized? And if it's a situation where they got saved in their deathbed, they didn't have a chance to get baptized or something like that. But if they got, if they were saved and never got baptized, then I would really question why they're not getting baptized because it clearly is a command to follow up with discipleship because I believe baptism is very important. I'm not, again, I'm not discounting it. I'm just don't, I don't believe it's a part of salvation as a connected key. I believe it's a, to follow Christ through discipleship. So there's a problem with discipleship. Um, so if the person is truly believed and truly trusted Christ, they should get baptized in order to follow Jesus in, in discipleship. If they die without it, they truly believe, yeah, they go to heaven. Uh, but again, I think we need to be careful about who we judge, who goes to heaven and hell, because I think only God, somebody could say they believed and they've been baptized, but only that individual and God knows for certain if who's going to heaven or not. So we got to be careful about who, who judging people like that, I think. But that's all I have. Appreciate it, John. Gavin, you get the last word. Go ahead. Um. And again, this, um, people in hospice, people that, you know, are coding in minutes away from death or seconds away from death, these are all emotional arguments. Um, that doesn't mean that they don't need to be wrestled with or dealt with or talked about. It just means it doesn't really take away from uh, what the text is plainly saying. Okay, thank you very much there, Gavin. Next question comes in from Nick. Nick's got a question, and the question is, if hating your brother in your heart is equivalent to murder, is it possible for someone unable to be baptized based on circumstances, yet desiring it in their heart the same as physically doing it? Go ahead, Gavin. I don't know if the individual is Catholic. I've heard, uh, I interact with a lot of people on, on social media. Um they talk about a baptism of desire. They say, well, the thief on the cross would have been baptized. He had a baptism of desire, so he received that. Um, and I have an issue with applying that text. Um, hating a brother in your heart is equivalent to murder, but if you hate someone, you don't need to be locked in prison for life. So the consequences and the reality of the situation, regardless of what that text is saying, it should be followed. Um, I don't think that has anything to do with it. Um, I don't. And as far as the emotional arguments go, I don't know of anyone who is unable to be baptized unless they, again, put off obeying the gospel until it's too late. We know people who Jesus talked about someone who was going to build up barns and, you know, why would his life be required of him? Why wouldn't he have time to obey the gospel? Um, again, uh, it's just splitting hairs and hypotheticals and it's an emotional argument. So I don't really see the the unable to be baptized being an issue unless someone has procrastinated so long or it affects uh, my position at all. Okay. Thank you, Gavin, John, over to you. Um, I, I think that's not maybe the best. I know what he means by that. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily the best comparison, uh, murder and hate. Yeah. I mean, in that context, but this is a completely different context when you're talking about baptism, uh, as far as desiring it, um, Obviously, you should desire and do it because not to be saved, but in order is discipleship. And that's kind of where I stand. But uh, wanting to do it in your heart, uh, is it the same as physically doing it? No, it's not. It's because it's a different context. Uh, you could desire it for years and not do it. But if you never get baptized, you still haven't been baptized. Okay, thank you, John. Back to you, Gavin. Question was for you, if you'd like a quick final word. I appreciate it. Um... John's being a little bit more hard line than some who will answer these kind of questions. So I, I think we agree to an extent. Um, wanting to be baptized and being baptized are different. And if someone's not baptized, then you, he's going to question their salvation. But uh, I guess I would for other reasons because of my understanding of how to interpret these passages. So I, I appreciate his, um, his strong views on that, if nothing else. Gavin, appreciate it. Okay, next question comes in from Professing Preterist. Question for Gavin. Why does John the Baptist specify that he baptizes with water, but the <coughs> but the one who will come after him will baptize with the Holy Spirit? I think this question uh, commits the problem that people accuse me of doing. Uh, the emphasis is on who will come after. It's not what he will do. Now, although 
there's a distinction to be made between water baptism and baptism of the Holy Spirit. That doesn't mean that baptism of the Holy Spirit um, washes sins away. And if you don't believe that that baptism of John washed sins away, I think it's inconsistent to say that the Holy Spirit baptism is going to wash sins away. But I can't, sorry, I can't say that because we backtrack that a little bit. Um, the purpose of John's baptism, we have to, again, look to Scripture and say, what is the purpose of John's baptism? The purpose of the Holy Spirit baptism, we need to look to the rest of Scripture and say, what's the purpose of Holy Spirit baptism? Just taking verses like this and say, oh, this is a contrast, this is a comparison, and putting our traditions and assumptions into play are, uh, are not going to, I think, uh, cut it completely. Thank you, Gavin. John, floor is yours. Well, I mean, obviously, there, there's a clear difference. You can't confuse what John the Baptist was doing with baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, John was just simply making a statement about what he was doing at the time because he was chosen, sovereignly chosen by God uh, to inaugurate the ministry of Jesus. And then he just he gives a prediction what Jesus will do in his ministry. That's all there is. Okay, thank you, John. Gavin, over to you. I can agree with that. The what John was doing, what Christ was doing, how what Christ is going to do is greater. I think you can get that message from it. But as far as what the purpose of John's baptism was or what Holy Spirit baptism is, we have to, again, define um, in the text that mentioned explicitly and then question whether it's mentioned elsewhere. Okay, thank you, Gavin. All right, I think we got time for one last question. As with the rest of the debate, the Q&A portion is flying by. We've had a lot of excellent questions and great responses from our guests tonight, John and Gavin. Think Ossifer, question for John. Is the word saves in 1 Peter 3.21 the same Greek word used by Paul for justify? I, I, I don't know. I'd have to look it up. I haven't looked it up. It's a great question. I I guess to elaborate on the question, if it were, what would how would that affect the doctrine being supported tonight? Let's say your position. Well, the way I understand first first Peter three twenty one, when you again when you see the word save or saves, you can't automatically commit the logical fallacy of that save means the same. It means condemnation from hell in every passage when you see save. So save there, first Peter three twenty one. Uh, if I remember correctly, is a reference to Noah and the ark. And uh, it talks about deliverance. And the word save can mean deliverance uh, from eternal con condemnation. It can mean deliverance from temporal uh, judgment. Uh, it can mean a save from sickness. I mean, it just depends on how, how you want to use the word. Uh, but the word, I don't know if it's, uh, I would say it's probably not the same word without looking it up. Because uh, justify obviously is a different word than save. You have to see how it's used in the context and that kind of stuff. Okay, thank you very much, John. Gavin, over to you. When you recognize water baptism is essential for salvation, a lot of the typology of the Old Testament really opens up to you. Not just the eight souls were saved from physical water and or saved physically by water, their physical lives were saved by water or through water. In verse 20, um, the antitype, the like figure, is baptism, which also saves us. Um, I wish I could elaborate, and you know, it would just be subjective how we identify these types and shadows and all those things, how water and spirit are uh, used throughout the Old Testament and all those things. Uh, baptized into Moses um, in the Red Sea crossing, there's a uh, Jordan River crossing as they come into the promised land, if that can be considered a baptism into Joshua, the same name as Jesus, they are circumcised, they're able to eat the Passover, and they're in the promised land. Um, again, that's typology. You could say that's subjective, but I think it's just a beautiful picture that we overlook if we don't understand uh, properly what the gospel is. Okay, Gavin, thank you very much. John, question was for you. You get the last word. That's all I have. All right, perfect. That wraps up the Q&A. Uh, to the audience, thank you, as usual, for sending in some really awesome questions, all very much on topic, the topic being uh, baptism. Lots of great positive feedback from our live chat as well. And so that speaks to our guests, Gavin and John. 
Uh, great job. Again, I appreciate the work put into the uh, prep for this uh, important debate. So why don't we get some uh, quick final words, final thoughts from our guests. John, let's start with you. Again, thanks for being here. Thanks for doing this. And some quick final words, final thoughts. Uh, thank you for having me, Donnie. First of all, I think this is my uh, fifth debate on uh, SFT. And I really appreciate this panel, uh, what you do. It's uh, really awesome what you do for the Lord. And you have a lot of great content on here, not just these debates, but many others. Uh, it's, it can be used as an educational tool for people that want to learn more and grow deeper in their faith and theology and doctrine, things of that nature. So I think that's, that's wonderful. And uh, I'm just excited to always be here. Uh, I would just tell anyone watching, I think you know my point, uh, what must I do to be saved, to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Uh, we didn't have enough time to get in all those passages. I would like to maybe do a part two to this, if Gavin is open for it, or if he just wants to come on for an open mic, maybe uh, just nothing but a discussion. Uh, I think that would be, be warranted considering we, we're under such time constraints, we don't get enough time to really break open every word and phrase and exegete like we we, sh we should be able to. But we just try to do the best we can do within the, the time constraints that we have. Uh, but it's been great to be here. Um, and, of course, I still stand with, with uh, that I believe in justification by faith alone. And I'm sure Gavin still stands where he is. But you as a viewer, you decide what you believe. Don't take our word for it. Go to the word of God and see for yourself. John, great having you. I appreciate the kind words. And thank you very much for the final words, final thoughts. Gavin, it's been great to have you back as well. And uh, appreciate your time for this debate. Final words, final thoughts? Well, thank you so much, Donnie. Thanks for having us on here. John, thank you for uh, agreeing to this or, or asking about this. And I kind of got invited on. Um, I'm totally for uh, more discussion in some way, shape, or form. Um, I kind of feel like I need to debate something other than baptism because there's there's so much more. I, I understand it's important for, uh, if we're talking about the gospel, we're talking about what saves as far as my view is concerned. But um, but I like what John said. You know, people are going to come here. They're going to have one view in mind or another view. But if anyone, you know, is questioning these things or whatever and you're just not sure where to go, uh, this is a perfect place for it and a good place to... Um, Look at both sides, see, you know, what questions you have, what's, what do you think is consistent or not, and, and just let you decide and look to the, I think, the scripture and scripture alone. Um, I don't like the idea of faith alone, but as far as scripture alone, I think we can agree on that, and that's where we need to go, and that's where we need to, um, to, uh, to get everything from. So let's focus on Christ and, and move forward. So I appreciate all that. Gavin, I appreciate the uh, <laughs> final words and final thoughts. Would definitely love to do a round two uh, between the both of you. Uh, you made it easy to moderate. You both kept it very professional. You kept it very scholarly. Lots of great points discussed. And so a round two, even on a different topic, I think would be a, a great idea. And, and as Gavin said, you know, these kinds of discussions are important. It gets us out of our theological echo chambers. It gets, uh, rather than one view, being uh, promoted. It gets uh, two views, uh, people with different views, obviously, into the debate octagon to discuss uh, these issues. And it allows the audience to see uh, multiple sides. And that way they, they can weigh the evidence and uh, come to their own informed conclusions. So Gavin and John, again, thank you so much for doing this. To the audience, thank you for tuning in. Uh, thank you for all of the questions, support, super chat, so on and so forth. So that wraps up another week of four events. We have uh, Sunday off as we usually do, but we will be back uh, first thing Monday for another uh, awesome week of events. With that, God bless all. Thanks for tuning in. Standing for Truth is out. <laughs>